Okay, and we are back. The first topic we're going to do is subject matter jurisdiction. That's going to primarily be uh, a federal uh, question jurisdiction, a diversity jurisdiction, a supplemental jurisdiction, and removal jurisdiction. Uh, let's start off with federal question jurisdiction. Okay. Now, this review is only for people taking the bar exam. It's not intended for JDs. Uh, JD exam is going to require a lot more detail, and there's a lot more that I would expect in my Civ Pro uh, JD students. Um, this review is not going to be covering everything in all detail. This is intended to cover some of the big issues for the bar exam. All right, federal question jurisdiction. First, we'll start out with Article 3. For the, there to be federal question jurisdiction, Article 3 has to be satisfied. And it's really easy to have federal question jurisdiction under the Constitution. All that's required is that the case or controversy have a federal ingredient. Those are the words, federal ingredient. So the federal issue could be a federal cause of action. It could be a federal defense. It could even be a state law claim that has an element within it that is federal. As long as there's some federal ingredient in the case, wherever it's found, the Constitution will be satisfied. The more serious analysis is under Section 1331, which is Congress's grant of original subject matter jurisdiction to the district courts for cases or controversies arising under the laws, constitution, uh, uh, or statutes of or treaties of the United States. Okay, that's what we call federal question jurisdiction. Now, to analyze this, there's several steps that are involved. And I'm going to give the basic steps. The first thing you need to do when analyzing the statute is do the well-pleaded comp complaint rule. You'll recall that from the Motley case, right? Remember, the plaintiff sued a railroad for breach of contract, and in their complaint they talked about anticipated federal defense saying, hey, we're suing you guys for breach of contract, but we suspect that the railroad is going to refer to some sort of federal statute as a defense. And in Motley, the Supreme Court told us that we have to look at what's called the well-pleaded complaint. The well-pleaded complaint rule is a filtering mechanism, a filtering uh, 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 step. All that tells you, all you do for the well-pleaded complaint, is you look at only the plaintiff's complaint and only the cause of action in the plaintiff's uh, complaint. All right. So if the plaintiff's cause of action is breach of contract, that arises under state law. Okay. What if the federal issue is in the federal defense? Say it's raised by the defendant. That doesn't count because under well pleaded complaint rule, you only look at the plaintiff's cause of action in the plaintiff's complaint. So, what doesn't count as a federal question here would be a federal defense raised by the defendant. What wouldn't count would also be a counterclaim raised by the defendant. So, for example, if the plaintiff sues the defendant for breach of contract, and then the defendant counterclaims for federal employment discrimination. Well, the well pleaded complaint rule would tell us to look only at the plaintiff's complaint. And the plaintiff's cause of action is breach of contract. All right? So, this first step, well pleaded complaint rule, it's a filtering rule. Tells us to only look at the plaintiff's cause of action in the plaintiff's complaint. We do not look at counterclaims, we do not look at federal defenses or anything like that. The second step is once we've looked only at the well-pleaded complaint is to ask whether the well-pleaded complaint contains a federal question. Okay? <clears throat> and there's two ways to do this. There's the easy way and there's the hard way. The easy way, so I'm going to call this step 2A, is the so-called Holmes test. That's from one of Justice Holmes' dissents in the case of American Well Works. The Holmes test tells us that a cause of action that, that determine whether cause of action arises under federal law or state law, ask who created the cause of action. If the cause of action was created by state lawmakers, then the cause of action arises under state law. If the cause of action was created by federal lawmakers, such as the U.S. Congress, then the cause of action arises under federal law. Okay? So, think of our breach of, breach of contract example. Breach of contract is state common law. That cause of action was created by state lawmakers. So under the Holmes test, a state, state law breach of, a breach of contract action arises under state law. In contrast, if plaintiff sues defendant for federal employment discrimination, well, it was the U.S. Congress that created this cause of action. 
And under the Holmes test, also known as the creation test, it was the U.S. Congress that created the Federal Employment Discrimination Cause of Action. And therefore, if a plaintiff's complaint, the plaintiff's cause of action, is for federal employment discrimination, then the Holmes test is satisfied and the case arises under the laws, statutes, or treaties of the United States. In other words, 1331 would be satisfied. Remember, I told you there's an easy way and there's a hard way. The hard way is the Grable slash gun test. Those are the cases that articulated it. Also known as the, I'm going to call it the EFQ, the Embedded Federal Question. The Embedded Federal Question is a second way to satisfy Section 1331. The Embedded Federal Question exists when you have a state law cause of action that includes a federal ingredient. Okay, So think of a state claim that's got some sort of federal virus in it, right? One of the issues or one of the elements is federal. And indeed, this can happen in a variety of contexts. For example, suppose you sue somebody for negligence per se. Negligence per se, is that a state law cause of action or a federal one? State, right? What lawmaker created it? State. So under the Holmes test, uh, negligence per se is a state law cause of action because state lawmakers created it. However, suppose the uh, 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 negligence cause of action referred to a duty element created by federal law. So say, for example, there's a federal statute requiring certain sorts of labeling on goods, right? Say like a drug needed to have a certain sort of label to comply with federal regulations, right? And the plaintiff sues the defendant for state law, common law negligence, but recites as the duty element the violation of a federal labeling standard. Well, this would flunk the Holmes creation test because the negligence per se cause of action was created by state law, all right? However, under the Grable test, maybe, maybe, this counts under 1331 as a federal question. So you have the state law cause of action with the federal ingredient. Here would be the, the duty element, okay? Well, Grable and Gunn give us a test for analyzing when the embedded federal question uh, satisfies section 1331. And it's, it's a very hard standard to meet. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the elements. The complaint has to necessarily raise a federal question. The federal question, or I should say federal issue, not federal question, all right. The federal issue is um, actually disputed. The federal issue is substantial. And allowing federal question jurisdiction uh, would not, WN would not change the balance between state and federal courts the way Congress wanted that balance to exist. Okay, now let me check the, the camera to make sure I'm getting all of this on the, uh, the video. But I'm going to keep talking. See? Yep, we're good. Well, the first two elements are really easy to meet. As long as the plaintiff's cause of action actually uh, lists the federal in ingredient as one of the elements, it's going to be both necessarily raised in the complaint and actually disputed, as long as the parties are fighting about that element, you know, whether the element's satisfied or not. The harder elements are going to be number three uh, and uh, number four. Um, is the federal issue uh, substantial? Well, the gun case tells us for a federal ingredient in a state law cause of action to be substantial, the federal ingredient has to be important to the federal system as a whole. Not important to the parties, but important to the federal system as a whole. So for example, okay, so for example, in the gun case, you had a plaintiff that sued his former lawyer for state law legal malpractice. And the basis for the legal malpractice claim, that's a state law claim, was that the lawyer had done a bad job litigating a prior patent case. Well, you, you probably know that patent claims arise under federal law, right? And it's, in fact, it's exclusive to the federal courts, okay, under another section of the, of the judicial code. Well, the question was, is we had this state law malpractice claim and it necessarily raised the federal issue of whether or not the lawyer did a good job litigating patent law, which required construction of patent law. The patent law was actually disputed was the patent law, the ingredient of the malpractice claim, a substantial? Uh, the Supreme Court said no. <coughs> the Supreme Court said no. 
Even though patent claims were exclusive to the federal courts, this patent issue in the state law claim wasn't substantial. Why? It was important to the parties, but it wouldn't affect the, uh, it wouldn't be substantial to the federal system as a whole. The Supreme Court said federal courts probably wouldn't be bound by it. Anything that was resolved wouldn't go beyond this particular patent and so on and so forth. Okay? So for something to be substantial, it's got to be substantial to the system as a whole. In contrast, okay, in the Grable case, the question was the construction of the Internal Revenue Code and whether certain kinds of notice had to require actual notice, okay, or notice through a, a personal service or some other kind of notice. The Supreme Court said that was substantial because the, the, the IRS's ability, the federal government's ability to get paid on taxes was a huge federal interest. Okay, substantial. Think important to the federal system as a whole, not just the parties. But finally, the last one, federal question, allowing federal question jurisdiction would not change the balance uh, between the state and federal courts dockets um, as approved by Congress. And what this means is we're not going to open the floodgates. Supreme Court doesn't want to open the floodgates. So think, for example, of the gun case, right? It was a legal malpractice action with a federal ingredient. Supreme Court said no federal question jurisdiction, no 1331 jurisdiction. Think of what would have happened if the court had allowed federal question jurisdiction in that case. Now, attorney malpractice is essentially just negligence, right? It's negligence in the context of lawyering. Well. If we had federal question jurisdiction in the gun case, then would that mean that any time somebody asserted a negligence claim that had some sort of federal duty in it, that there would be federal jurisdiction? If that was the case, then the, then the federal courts would be open to a huge variety of uh, state law tort claims between, between non-diverse parties and between parties where the amount of controversy isn't above $75,000. would be a huge expansion of federal uh, subject matter jurisdiction. So. Another thing that factors in here is that we don't want to flood the federal courts. Okay, so that's essentially it over federal question uh, jurisdiction. Uh, I suppose the last thing I'll add to that is there's other bases for federal question jurisdiction besides 1331. What I mean are causes of action created by Congress, right? For example, copyrights and trademarks are exclusive to the federal courts. So not only do, do such uh, uh, causes of action have jurisdiction in the federal courts, but they're exclusive to the federal courts. Um, there's other varieties as well, uh, federal interpleader jurisdiction. But I'm not going to get into all of that detail. You know, our time today is necessarily limited. So now I'm going to move on. And the next thing we're going to discuss is going to be uh, diversity. While I'm erasing that, by the way, I will tell you one thing. Just to remind you, this does screw people up from time to time. Most federal causes of action are concurrent to both the state and the federal courts. That means that even if there's federal question jurisdiction, say over federal employment discrimination, it can also be heard in state courts. In other words, most types of federal question jurisdiction under 1331 are also concurrent jurisdiction in the state courts. It's only when federal question jurisdiction or when federal jurisdiction is uh, uh, exclusive to the federal courts, the state courts can't hear it. Examples include patent and copyright. All right, now we're on diversity jurisdiction. Next topic. And I'm going to be paying close attention to the, uh, to the uh, clock. All right, first, under Article 3. All right, Article 3 permits claims between citizens of different states. It also permits claims between citizens of a state and foreigners. Citizens are subjects of a foreign state. All right. Article 3 requires only minimal diversity and it has no amount in controversy. So for example, under the Constitution, you could have a citizen of Florida sue a citizen of Pennsylvania and a citizen of Florida for a tort claim for a dollar. That would satisfy the Constitution because we have minimal diversity. At least one plaintiff is diverse from at least one defendant and there's no requirement of an amount in controversy. All right, That satisfies the Constitution. But as, as you all know from your very first week of law school, that's not going to satisfy Section 1332 a diversity statute. And that requires, <coughs> under the, the main section, 1332A1, 
a complete diversity and an amount in controversy that exceeds. That's the Moore sign from those of you that, that remember math from high school or college. Mountain controversy of more than $75,000, uh, not counting interest um, or costs. All right, now let's talk about each of these elements um, um, one by one. Now first, complete diversity requirement, all right? Well, to know whether the parties are completely diverse, and complete diversity means you can't have Florida versus PA and Florida, because these two aren't diverse from one another, right? But how do you know which state somebody is a citizen of, right? All right, well, to be a COS, a citizen of a state, requires two things. Now, first, you have to be a US citizen. And that trips people up all the time. You must be a US citizen. And second, you must be domiciled in a state. Uh, both of these must exist. So for example, say I'm a French citizen who's domiciled in Florida. Am I a citizen of a state? No. no, because both of these aren't satisfied. Suppose I'm a US citizen who's domiciled in France. Am I a citizen of a state? No. I would be stateless. In fact, by my best knowledge, as, as my former 1Ls will remember, if you are a U.S. citizen who's domiciled abroad, you're like Johnny Depp, okay? Who I believe lives in France, right? So he's a U.S. citizen, but he's not a citizen of a state. And he's not a foreigner because he's a U.S. citizen. That means he's stateless. Stateless people cannot be sued under 1332, and they cannot sue under 1332. They want to sue in federal court, there has to be some other basis, such as federal question jurisdiction. Or they can just sue in or be sued in state court. All right? So you've got to be a U.S. citizen who's domiciled in a state. Well, how do you assess domicile? All right? Well, there's two elements to that. First element is residence. And the second element is what I call the requisite intent. All right? Now, when you're born, I was born in Pennsylvania, okay, so my initial domicile was Pennsylvania. Um, a number of years ago, I moved down to Florida to, to work here at St. Thomas Law, okay. Well, I moved, took up residence in Florida with the intent to stay here indefinitely, okay. That means I'm domiciled in Florida. And since I'm a U.S. citizen who's domiciled in Florida, I'm a citizen of Florida for diversity purposes, okay. But I'm being fishy on the intent is because courts split on the intent that's required. Some just require that you have the intent to remain somewhere for the time at least. Think, I'm going to be here for a little while and then I'm going to leave. Or the intent to be to remain indefinitely. Okay, I'm moving to wherever. I'm going to move to Alaska and then I get into Alaska and when I get there I think, I'm going to stay here till whenever. I don't know when I'm going to leave. I might leave eventually, but I don't know when I'm going to leave. I'm staying indefinitely. It's open-ended, right? And they intend to stay permanently. Now that happens very rarely. Whoever moves anywhere with an intent to stay there permanently, right? So the majority test is the intent to stay def indefinitely. So if you get a scenario that requires you to assess um, um, a domicile, most likely, most likely they're looking for the indefiniteness test, right? The majority test that's the one here in the middle. That would be my best guess, okay? So that's how you measure a citizen of um, a state, all right? But keep in mind that you can also have jurisdiction under Section 1332 in other scenarios, scenarios including foreigners. So under 1332A2, you have jurisdiction over uh, 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 claims between a citizen of a state and a citizen or subject of a foreign state. That's also known as alienage jurisdiction. That's something that came up in the famous Moz case in your, ca in your case book. So for example, you could have a citizen of France versus a citizen of uh, Florida. Uh, that would be fine for purposes of diversity, you know, as long as the amount of controversy is already met. Okay? You could also have <coughs> No, let me, let me go this way. But my next question is, what about this? 
What if a citizen of France is domiciled in Florida, right? Suppose you have a, a French citizen that moves to Florida, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, okay? And now I'm domiciled in Florida. That starts to smell bad, right? Because it's almost like somebody who's from the same state is suing somebody from the same state, right? And you, you don't want to have that. Well, Congress has addressed this in part. So if you look in the language of Section 1332A2, you'll see language that says, when a foreign citizen is a lawful permanent resident, here, let me rewrite it this way. If the foreign citizen is a lawful permanent resident, and domiciled in the same state as an opposing party, then there's no alienage jurisdiction. So when it was just the French person versus the uh, Florida person, okay, the French citizen versus the Florida citizen, that'd be fine. But if it turns out that the French citizen is getting uh, her green card, they're a lawful permanent resident, and they're domiciled in the same state as an opposing party, then there's no subject matter jurisdiction at all under Section 1332A2. And as a policy matter, that makes sense, right? They essentially are, this one is a citizen of Florida, and this one is functionally almost the same thing, right? So no alienage jurisdiction um, there at all. Now there's other sections in 1332, but I'm not going to go over them. But if you go to my website on my video, I have an extensive video that goes through other portions of 1332 involving much more complex um, um, diversity scenarios. And just look at my webpage under complex diversity and, and you'll find that video there. All right. But now I'm, I'm, now I'm going to focus more on the basics and I'm going to move on to the um, amount um, in controversy. Oh, my bad. Before I go there, I should, should talk about one more thing about citizenship. My bad. It's about corporate citizenship. Okay. What if a party is a corporation? Well, if the citizen, if, the, if one of the parties is a corporation, then we need to look to incorporation and to the principal place of business. Now, the, the law tells us that a corporation is a citizen of any state or foreign country where the corporation is incorporated and the principal place of business. Now these two first, these two places could be different, right? So for example, a Florida, a company that's got its headquarters in Florida, principal place of business, okay? That's incorporated in Delaware, place of incorporation. It's a citizen of both places, okay? Now to determine place of incorporation is easy. Um, a fact pattern is going to likely tell you where the company, where the corporation is incorporated, okay? And that can be more than one place. Corporations can actually be incorporated in multiple places. It's rare, but it does happen. Regarding principal place of business, because the statute uses the phrase the principal place of business, that means there's one and only one principal place of business. Now, in the Hertz case, the Supreme Court clarified how do we determine principal place of business, okay? Because they'll go about it. Companies like Walmart. Their, their headquarters are in, in Arkansas, but they have operations all over the country and all over the world, and probably the biggest place of operations would be California, because it's the biggest state and they have the most stores there, right? So what's Walmart's principal place of business? Is it Arkansas with the headquarters, or is it California where it does the most business? Well, the answer here would be Arkansas, because in the Hertz case, the Supreme Court said that we use the nerve center test to determine principal place of business, which means we look to the place most likely to be PPOB is going to be the headquarters. So if the fact pattern tells you the corporation is incorporated in state A, say Delaware, and it's got its headquarters in New York, then that means it's inked in, in Delaware and it's PPOB, principal place of business, is in um, New York. Okay. Uh, another thing on, on, on businesses, and this is something that you'll, you'll uh, get much more deeply now that you, you've had business orgs or business associations, is corporations, as you know, are not the same things as general partnerships, limited partnerships, LLPs, LLLPs, and the like. Okay. Well, how do you measure uh, diversity um, for uh, things like that? Now, the current state of the law is as follows. The general trend in the law is that anything that is a partnership, a general partnership, a limited partnership, or even an LLP, limited liability partnership, 
or an LLC, limited liability. What does LLC stand for? Limited liability what? Very good. Company, not corporation, company, and that's key. These types of entities are not treated the same as corporations. To determine the citizenship of any of these entities, the general rule is we look to the citizenship of each and every owner, right? Whether it's a member, that's the term we use with LLCs, right? Or partner, you know, for general partnerships or limited and general partner, right? For uh, uh, limited partnerships and so on. You look to the citizenship of each and every one. So if all y'all in the front row, okay, are, 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 are LLC members um, and you operate out of Florida, but you're a citizen of Alaska, right? And New York and, and Hawaii, right? And Pennsylvania and so on. Well, then guess what? The LLC is a citizen of all of those states as well. We look to, to the people, right? Not to the entity. Um, there is a thing called a PC, all right? Some states, uh, uh, for example, lawyers might uh, set up their operations as a PC, which stands for professional corporation. Very good. Well, corporation, corporation. So we use the, the, the test that I did earlier, right? Look to the place of incorporation and the, also uh, uh, the principal place of business, okay? Um, last thing about determining citizenship is citizenship of <coughs> representatives, right? Like the decedent of, of an estate, right? Well, if you have a representative such as a decedent, uh, a, a representative of an estate, so that'd be an executor, a uh, administrator of the decedent's estate, you look to the estate itself. You look to the, to the uh, uh, citizenship of um, the decedent. So if the decedent was a citizen, for example, suppose you have Bob, citizen of Florida, as representative of the estate of Sally, uh, citizen of uh, Georgia, okay? Well, it, to the extent that Bob is suing in his representative capacity, we measure Bob's citizenship by looking at Sally's citizenship. She's the decedent, he's a representative, okay? Now here's a tricky one they might throw at you. Suppose Bob was Sally's spouse and Bob sues both in his capacity as a representative of the estate and on his own behalf for whatever, um, NIED, right? Negligent infliction of emotional distress, right? We have two causes of action, one that belongs to the estate and the other one that belongs to who? Bob, right? Ah, what does that mean? That means the extent that it's a claim for the estate, that's a citizen of Georgia asserting it. To the extent it's a claim of Bob, it's a citizen of Florida, right? Okay, let me look at my outline real quick, but I think that's all on um, determining uh, uh, residence or citizenship. All right, now let's move on to the second element, which is a mountain controversy, okay? Now this one is much quicker. A mountain controversy. Uh, first of all, don't let this trip you up. The amount of controversy under section uh, 1332 is not $75,000. It's in excess of $75,000 and you don't get to include cost or interest, okay? So if you see a fact pattern that say this A sued B for $75,000, you know, and, and, and the only basis for jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction would be diversity. Well, there's not diversity. It's got to be more than $75,000. Well, how does the court construe the amount in controversy? Well, now we've got to look to the <coughs> St. Paul Mercury Test, SPM, St. Paul Mercury Test, that's from a case. And what the court does is it will accept the plaintiff's pleaded amount in controversy so long as it was pleaded, one, in good faith, GF, so long as the plaintiff has, has pleaded the amount in good faith, two, unless the court knows that the AIC, here, unless, unless the AIC not met to a legal certainty, okay? So here's one of my standard hypos. A sues B under a state statute um, for making, uh, 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 sending spam emails, okay? Say there's a state statute that says every time someone sends you a spam email, all right, you can get statutory damages of $1,000. No more, no less, no other kinds of damages. So if you sue somebody for sending you 10 spam emails, the most you can get is $10,000, right? 
Because the only damages that are permitted is 1,000 per email. You got 10 emails. Just do the math. Suppose I sue somebody and say, hey, I'm suing you under the state statute. And you sent me 10 emails. And I'm so mad, I want punitive damages. And I want $100,000. Well, too bad for me. Even if I believe in good faith, I'm entitled to $100,000. If the law makes it clear to a legal certainty that I cannot get over $75,000, then the court will say the amount in controversy is not satisfied. Okay, so accept the plaintiff's amount so long as it appears to be made in good faith. Okay, unless the amount in controversy cannot be met to a legal certainty. How do we know whether we're legally certain? Well, you'd have to look at the governing law, right? So look the fa if a St. Paul Mercury issue comes up, look for facts that indicate either the amount in controversy is absurd, absurd, right? Somebody's pleading a million dollars for somebody just giving them a dirty look but not causing any emotional harm or physical harm and the like, right? Or some sort of statute that says, you know, there's statutory damages, it's this much, no more, no less. Okay? I think that's it for diversity uh, jurisdiction. Ah, one more thing. Aggregation, not aggravation. Aggravation is what you guys are going to have over the next two months as you're studying for the bar exam. Or rather, aggregation, which is when you get to add amounts of controversy together. All right. Here we go. Suppose Florida citizen sues a citizen of Pennsylvania and asserts two causes of action. One is $50,000 for breach of contract, <laughs> and the other one is $50,000 for an unrelated battery. Okay? Is the amount in controversy met? $50,000 for breach of contract, and then $50,000 for an unrelated battery. The answer is yes. Remember, I said the battery was unrelated. Okay, under the aggregation rule, any one plaintiff can add together all damages she has against any one defendant in order to meet the amount in controversy. Okay, and here I have two causes of action. Note that I said the second one was unrelated. Okay, well. If the plaintiff would win and get all the damages pled for, the plaintiff would be getting $100,000, right? Hey, you owe me $50,000 for that breach, right? And you also owe me $50,000 for, for the battery. Two separate damages, two separate claims, and the amount is $100,000. It's called aggregation. Now, putting the rules of joinder aside, suppose plaintiff was seeking $50,000 for breach of contract against one person and $50,000 for battery against a second person. Okay? Well, aggregation is not going to be permitted here. Because remember what I said, aggregation is when you can add a plaintiff's amount, all of his or her claims, up against any one opposing party. Here are two separate opposing parties. This is not going to fly. Because what we have is one claim for $50,000 against one and one for $50,000 against another. You can't add those together because they're against different defendants. Aggregation is not permitted here. Here's another thing to watch out for. Suppose you have a claim for $50,000 for breach of contract and $50,000 for fraud. And say both claims concern a contract, but they're just two different legal theories trying to get the same $50,000 from the same defendant, right? Is the amount in controversy met? No, because what you have are just two different legal theories of recovery towards the same $50,000 uh, damages, right? You could have it other ways. You know, P sues D for $50,000 for negligence. And count two is $50,000 for strict liability. Count three is $50,000 for breach of warranty. But it's the same $50,000 under different legal theories. That's not aggregation, that's just pleading the alternative. The amount of controversy there is just $50,000. Okay. I do think that will do it for, um, <coughs> excuse me, diversity. Now what we're going to do next is supplemental jurisdiction, and then we'll close out this portion uh, with a removal jurisdiction, and then I'll pause, and maybe we'll even take a short break. Okay. So the next subject is supplemental uh, jurisdiction. <coughs> Here we go. Now, supplemental jurisdiction, in my estimation, is uh, like an ice cream cone. What do I mean by that? 
<laughs> you guys just made me so happy. That's, that's right. Okay. If the cone itself, right, this part, is a quart, well, a cone by itself isn't an ice cream cone, it's just a cone. To have a cone, you need ice cream and a cone, right? Well, to have a civil action, you need a court that has jurisdiction, right? Well, if the cone is the court, then this ice cream is original jurisdiction, right? You need both to have a civil action, right? Now, original jurisdiction could be 1331 uh, federal question, it could be 1332 uh, diversity, 1335 interpleader, 1338 uh, patent and copyright, and there, there's plenty of other jurisdictional statutes that I won't get into, right? Well, if you have OJ, what about supplemental jurisdiction? Well, supplemental jurisdiction in this hypothetical are the sprinkles that go on the ice cream. Now, you can have an ice cream cone that's just ice cream and a cone, but you can't have an ice cream cone that's a cone and sprinkles. If all you have is a cone filled with sprinkles, then what you have is, is like, I don't know, sugar overdose, right? That'd be disgusting. If you want sprinkles, there got, better be some ice cream to put the sprinkles on. And equally so, with supplemental jurisdiction, you can't have supplemental jurisdiction unless you have original jurisdiction. All right? So, supplemental jurisdiction, 1367, can occur unless you have original jurisdiction. In other words, you can't have sprinkles unless they go on the ice cream. Which now takes us to supplemental jurisdiction statute itself, section 1367. All right, well, <coughs> I've long believed that the supplemental jurisdiction statute is, is actually quite easy uh, once you realize the roles and purposes of each part of um, the, the section of the, of the uh, statute. And the first one is the grant, okay? 1367A is a grant of supplemental jurisdiction. And what it says is, if you have original jurisdiction, then you'll have supplemental jurisdiction over all other parties or claims. All right, here, I should do this over here. If OJ, or if original jurisdiction, then SJ over all claims or parties, all right? that are so related that they form the same case or controversy under the U.S. Constitution. What this means in practice that you've got to have the old CNOF, common, what's that mean? Nucleus. Very good, common nucleus of operative, operative facts. Okay, common nucleus of operative facts is not quite the same thing as transaction or occurrence. It's probably a little broader, but it's the same idea. Okay, you have a commonality in the material facts between the original claim and the supplemental claim. All right? So what you're doing here is you're comparing one thing to the other. My right hand is the original claim over which there's original jurisdiction. Here's the claim that lacks original jurisdiction. There's not diversity. There's not federal question. But it's really similar. The same evidence is going to be used for each. In fact, the evidence that's similar between the two is material to both claims. There's a substantial overlap here, okay? That's the scenario where this part might be satisfied, okay? So you get to a scenario like this, you need to compare the original jurisdiction claim to the claim lacking jurisdiction. Ask, are they similar enough? Think about things like evidence, timing, right? Logical connections, things like that. Well. If this first step, step is satisfied, then 1367A grants supplemental jurisdiction. But that is not the end of the analysis. You got to move on to 1367B, which takes away, it divests the grant of jurisdiction in 1367A. All right? 1367B kicks in under certain scenarios only. The first question you have to ask is, what was the basis for the original jurisdiction? What kind of ice cream are we dealing with? Is it a federal question? Is it diversity? Is it both? All right. What are the basis or bases for original jurisdiction? If the basis for original jurisdiction includes a federal question, then you don't have to analyze B at all beyond that threshold question. 
All right. However, what if the only basis for original jurisdiction is diversity, right? Then you got to take a close look at 1367B. And 1367B is going to take away the grant of supplemental jurisdiction in certain joinder scenarios. Now here's one of the keys. This is really important. 1367B will take away supplemental jurisdiction only in scenarios where the ice cream is diversity flavored. Okay, it's 1332 only jurisdiction. And the claim that supplemental is being asserted by a plaintiff against certain types of defendants. Okay? And there's a joinder scenario. Okay, you gotta engage in a little joinder analysis here. So it takes away when? First, um, OJ is 1332 only. Next, it's a claim by a plaintiff. And third, you gotta look at the laundry list in 1367B. So first you gotta ask, is this a claim by a claim, claim, here I'm gonna do it this way, claim by a plaintiff that is either plaintiff versus uh, 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 19, uh, oh, excuse me, 14, 19, uh, 20, or 24, rules 14, 19, 20, or 24. I do want to peek at the statute, make sure I'm not getting this wrong, but I'm like a thousand percent positive that I'm right. Yeah. Or to claims by plaintiffs proposed to be joined under Rule 19. All right, so a claim by any plaintiff proposed to be joined under Rule 19, that's a uh, compulsory joinder. The third is any claim by a plaintiff uh, seeking to intervene under Rule 24. All right, the one that usually comes up is probably going to be this scenario. So look for claims by plaintiffs against people joined under Rule 14, 19, 20, or 24. We'll talk about joinder a little bit later, but remember, Rule 14 is third party practice known as impleter. Rule 19 is compulsory joinder. Rule 20 is permissive joinder. And Rule 24 is intervention. Okay? But let me illustrate that with a quick example. Suppose you have plaintiff citizen of Florida versus two defendants, okay, Pennsylvania 1 and Pennsylvania 2, say it's a negligence claim, the claim against pl plaintiff 1 is $100,000, and the claim against defendant number 2 is $10,000, okay? Now, do we have original jurisdiction over this claim? Yeah. Parts are diverse, the mountain controversy is met. So here we have 1332 ice cream, original jurisdiction. Do we have original jurisdiction over Florida versus Pennsylvania too? No. Parts are diverse, the mountain controversy is too low. All right, we go to supplemental. Is there OJ? If OJ, then there's supplemental jurisdiction. If the claim over additional claims or parties, if there's a common nucleus of operative fact between both claims. Suppose I tell you that. Um, this is, <coughs> this is an insurance company and this is a related insurance company, but here there was a $10,000 cap on the insurance policy. And that's why we're seeking $100,000 versus the one, but $10,000 versus the other, because $10,000 would be the most we could get for the second claim. But both are seeking recovery for the same claim, okay? Well, it would appear that we have a common nucleus of operative fact. So even though the amount of controversy is too low, these claims are so related, it's the same constitutional case and 1367A grants supplemental jurisdiction. Ah, but what about B? Well, we have to ask, is original jurisdiction 1332 only? Is it diversity only? And the answer is, uh, yeah, right? Well, then we need to continue. Is the claim the supplemental a claim by a plaintiff? Oh, yeah, it is, right? Ah, well, do we fall in any of the joinder scenarios? And the answer is yes. This is a claim by a plaintiff against defendants joined under Rule 20. Okay, permissive joinder of defendants. That means that 1367A grants supplemental jurisdiction, but 1367B uh, divests it. And therefore, there's no supplemental jurisdiction over that claim at all. Okay, 
Now I'm going to go briefly over the other parts of 1367C. 1367C, I call it punt. All right. What 1367C says is that even if there's supplemental jurisdiction, that the district court can exercise discretion, not required to, but has discretion to decline to exercise that supplemental jurisdiction in certain scenarios. Right? For example, the supplemental claim uh, predominates over the claims having original jurisdiction. Right? Or, or the original jurisdiction claims have been dismissed, leaving only the supplemental jurisdiction claim. Or the supplemental jurisdiction claim is, is one of state law that's, that's complex, right? Well, let's let the state courts deal with it, okay? Discretion. 1367D is a savings clause that says <coughs> if you dismiss a claim under 1367, then there's 30 days to refile it in a court that has subject matter jurisdiction. So say, for example, in this scenario, say this claim was asserted against the insurance company while, uh, before the statute of limitations passed, okay? But during the litigation, the statute of limitations is expired. Well, 1367D says is, well, even though the statute of limitations is expired, you'll get at least another 30 days to refile in state court. It's a savings clause. All right, what about else about supplemental jurisdiction? Let's spend a minute or two talking about the Supreme Court's important case of um, Exxon versus um, Alipata. All right, Exxon versus Alipata arose because of this second clause here. Divesting regarding any claim by a plaintiff joined under Rule 19. Note what's absent here. There's no mention in the second clause of Rule 20. Okay, permissive joinder, or 23 class actions. Well, here's the scenario in Exxon versus Alipata. Actually, it's the, the Starkist uh, Tuna case, the Ortega case, that was part of the joint case. Suppose you have, and, and here we're just going to assume uh, diversity, okay, and the question is going to be a mountain controversy. Now, well, let's give states. Okay, never mind. Okay, you got Florida 1 and Florida 2 versus defendant who's a citizen of uh, 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 Pennsylvania. And the first defendant seeks $100,000, and the second defendant seeks $10,000. All right? First claim has original jurisdiction. No problem. They're diverse. The amount of controversy exceeds 75. Second one lacks original jurisdiction. But let's assume that the claims are sufficiently related such that 1367A would grant, okay? In fact, in the Ortega case, it was a little girl who sued because sued uh, Starkist Tuna because she sliced her hand on a can of tuna and her hand was all cut up. So assume the daughter sues for $100,000 and then the mom or dad sue for $10,000, okay? For the emotional loss, whatever, you know, the, uh, the pain and suffering. All right, well this one, the claims are sufficiently connected that we have a common nucleus, but what about 1367B? Well, the original claim is 1332. Okay, this is a claim by a plaintiff, but none of these joinder scenarios are listed here. This is not a claim by a plaintiff joined under 14, 19, 20, or 24, because this means you'd have to have more than, you'd have to have either more than one defendant, or you'd have to have a third party defendant, or things like that, okay, or somebody who's intervened. There's only one defendant here. There's no additional defendants who have been joined. So the first scenario isn't, isn't satisfied. And the third one is clearly not satisfied because nobody's intervened, right? What about the second scenario? Well, this is not, excuse me, well, look at the second scenario. Claims by, pla claims by plaintiffs proposed to be joined under Rule 19. Well, these aren't plaintiffs proposed to be joined under Rule 19. Okay, that's when parties are required, right? Right? These are two separate claimants that could sue separately on their claims if they want, but they've chose to permissively join themselves under Rule 20. All right? This is what we have here is Rule 20 plaintiffs versus a defendant. Okay? And that's not listed there. There was a drafting error in 1367. Well, what the Supreme Court said in Alipata is, well, you know, it's not listed there. And therefore, B does not divest supplemental jurisdiction in this fact pattern. Okay? There is supplemental jurisdiction under A, and B does not divest, because this jointer scenario, Rule 20 plaintiffs versus defendant, is not listed in this second scenario over here. Okay? But 
The Supreme Court did tell us about a twist that would mess everything up, the so-called contamination theory. Justice Kennedy, who wrote the opinion in Exxon versus Zalapata, was worried about gutting the complete diversity requirement, so he posed a hypothetical. What if the case looks like this? All right, Florida versus PA for $100,000 and PA versus PA for $10,000. Common nucleus, so A is satisfied. Under B, original jurisdiction's diversity, and this is a Rule 20 plaintiff versus defendant, so two, or, or 1367B wouldn't take away jurisdiction. But what he said is he drew a distinction between the amount of controversy requirement and the complete diversity requirement. And what he said was that if this second person here, the second claim lacking AIC, if we had a problem here with diversity, then there's no jurisdiction over the case of controversy at all. In other words, the presence of a non-diverse, and here I mean citizenship, presence of a non-diverse litigant on the other side of the V destroys original jurisdiction. Okay? Now when this person here was Florida, it was fine. Because the only defect was the lack of amount of controversy. But when this person is not diverse, it destroys everything. In fact, even if the amount here was $100,000, that would still not have subject matter jurisdiction. Now how we rationalize it is kind of interesting. The problem here is not 1367B, because there's no mention here of Rule 20 plaintiffs versus one defendant in this scenario. The problem here is 1367A. What is the threshold requirement for supplemental jurisdiction under 1367A? Yeah, original jurisdiction. What, what he said was that if you have a non-diverse litigants on both sides of the coin here, that destroys the original jurisdiction. That means not only is there no jurisdiction over PA versus PA, but none over Florida versus PA either. Which means the problem here is not 1367B. The problem here is 1367A and 1332. There's no jurisdiction at all, right? But I suppose if we dismiss this person, then that can cure things and the court can hear this claim, but if you want to have the PA versus PA in there, that's not going to fly at all because it contaminates the original jurisdiction. All right, um, that's it on supplemental jurisdiction, and we have just one more topic to cover for um, subject matter jurisdiction, <coughs> and that's going to be a removal jurisdiction here. Removal. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is the terminology, all right? Removal and remand. Here's state court, and here's the federal court, all right? Removal is when the case is snatched out of a state court and removed in the federal court. Remand, for purposes of the removal statutes, remand is when the judge in the federal court sends the case back down to the state court, okay? Now, don't get confused by this. Suppose a civil action is filed in federal court, okay? It's originally filed in federal court. Suppose subject matter jurisdiction is lacking. Say, Florida sues Florida for a dollar for, for a battery, okay? Florida for Florida, battery a dollar. It's filed in federal court. Is there subject matter jurisdiction? No, there's not. Okay. Should the judge remand the case to state court? No, because it wasn't removed from state court. What the court judge should do here is dismiss, right? Now suppose the case was removed from state court. Florida versus Florida for a dollar for, for a battery. Removed to federal court. The court lacks subject matter jurisdiction. Should the court dismiss or should it remand? Remand. You can only remand to state court when it was removed from state court originally, okay? So keep the terminology straight. Now, <laughs> in order to have removal, okay, there has to be original jurisdiction or original jurisdiction plus supplemental jurisdiction, right? In other words, you can't remove a case from state court to federal court unless the federal court would have 
subject matter jurisdiction. That means either original jurisdiction or some combination of original and supplemental jurisdiction. Okay? So for example, if you sue somebody in state court for violating federal uh, uh, employment discrimination laws, okay? Well, that case is removable because it could have been filed initially in federal court, right? Suppose a, a citizen of, say a citizen of Pennsylvania sues a citizen of uh, Florida um, in Alaska state court. All right. And the suit is for, I don't know, some sort of fraud under state law for a million dollars. Okay. Can the defendant remove this case? to federal court, citizen of Pennsylvania versus a citizen of Florida. It's a fraud. Amount of, 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 of amount of controversy is a million bucks. Let's assume that's in good faith, okay? It was filed in Alaska state court. Can the defendant remove to federal court? Absolutely, don't overthink it. The answer is yes, okay? Could this have been originally filed in federal court? Yeah, yeah sure. Amount of controversy over 75 and then parties are completely diverse. Not a problem. What if the lawsuit was filed originally in Florida state court? Can that be removed to federal court? Yes. Uh, no, the answer is no. Because what we have here is known under as the forum defendant rule. Forum defendant rule under section 1441, I think it's 1441b2 off the top of my head says that if you're removing a case and the only basis for removal is diversity, then you can't remove if any, any uh, defendant is a citizen of the forum state. Okay, so suppose the case is, say there's several defendants, it's Pennsylvania versus Florida and Pennsylvania versus Georgia, and we're seeking that million dollars against both, and it's filed in Florida state court. Can this be removed? to federal court? And the answer is no. Why? Because at least one of the defendants, why? Because the basis for uh, uh, original jurisdiction would only be um, diversity and at least one of the defendants is a citizen of the forum state. What's interesting about this, that means the scope of removal is narrower than the scope of original jurisdiction. Could this case be filed originally in Florida federal court? Could it? Yes. Are the parties completely diverse? Yes. Mountain controversy met? Yes. Could this be filed in Florida federal court? Yes. yes. Ah, but if it's filed in Florida state court, it can't be removed. Why? Because it's, it's a diversity case and the, uh, one of the defendants is a citizen um, of the forum state. Now, some mechanics about removal. Say this is filed in uh, New York state. Let's, let, let's have it filed in Pennsylvania state court. All right, Pennsylvania state court is where it's filed. Suppose defendant one, Florida, wants to remove, but defendant two, Georgia, doesn't want to remove. Can the case be removed? No, no that's correct. All defendants have to consent to removal. Okay? What about timing of removal? How long do the defendants have to remove? 30 days after service. Okay? So suppose, so, you know, say if these guys are both sued on the first day of the month, then they have 30 days after that to remove to federal court. What if this person is sued on day, this person is served on day one, this person is served uh, on day 10, right? Well, then that affects the timing of removal because these defendants were served at different times, right? What that means is this defendant has 30 additional days after service to remove, but because this one was served on day 10, now it's plus 30 days after the second defendant is served and they can both join in on the notice of removal. Okay? Now, what about remand? What about remand? Say you have a case that's removed and the, the, the defendant, let's see, it's removed and the plaintiff doesn't think removal was appropriate. Say, for example, go back to our original example. We have uh, Florida versus uh, 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 Georgia <laughs> for a million dollars and it's filed in Georgia State Court, okay? The defendant removes it, okay? Now that was an inappropriate removal, wasn't it, right? All right, hmm, 
Hmm. No, I don't want to use this example for a variety of reasons. Let's see. What's a better? Oh, here's a better example. My bad. There's a reason why I don't want to use this hypo. Let's say it is. Okay. On day 50, the defendant removes. Okay. Was removal appropriate? It was too late, right? It was more than 30 days. So the plaintiff wants to seek remand. Okay. Well, this is a basis for remand because there was a procedural defect in the notice of removal. Why? Because it was 20 days too late. It should have been filed within 30 days. Instead, it was filed on day 50, right? So now the plaintiff who wanted to be in state court is seeking remand back to state court, right? How long does the plaintiff have to seek remand to state court? Don't overthink it. 30 days. That's right. 30 days measured from what? From the removal. That's right. So if the case was removed on day 50, then the plaintiff has up to, what's 50 plus 30? Nice, 80 days. Up to the 80th day, let's call it D80, day 80, to seek remand, okay? Now, this timing requirement is when there's a procedural defect in the removal itself, okay? What if, however, the defect was one of subject matter jurisdiction. So suppose Florida sues Florida for a dollar in Florida court, state court. All right? And again, state law cause of action. Florida versus Florida for a dollar in Florida state court. And the defendant removes. What's the problem with removal now? Is it procedural or is it something more serious? Yeah, it's subject matter jurisdiction. Now, it is, it is uh, any time up till final judgment that uh, remand can be sought. Okay, any time up until final judgment. The reason is subject matter jurisdiction is that much more interesting. <coughs> now, there's other twists to removal. Um, I'm not going to get into them, but what you can do is look on my website. In fact, what I'll do briefly here is I'll point out some of the uh, things on the website that you can look at. I'll just tell you because otherwise it'll, it'll take too long to pull up this stuff. But I have problem sets, okay? Problem sets on federal question and on diversity and on supplemental jurisdiction and on removal and handouts on various things such as diversity and on supplemental jurisdiction and a supplemental jurisdiction flow chart and, and a, a chart that explains um, the difference between aggregation and 1367 a, after Exxon uh, versus Alipata. I have a removal uh, problem set which goes into uh, more detail than time is going to permit me to do here. But we only have like four hours and we're already uh, um, like an hour and ten minutes in and we have so much more to cover. So here's what I suggest. Um, I'm going to stop the video in a second, and uh, we can take a short little break, okay, so you guys can, can, can rest for a second, stretch your legs. Um, I'll be up here for any questions you have, and then we'll reconvene. Let's see, it is 3... Here, I'm just going to stop the camera because nobody wants to watch us talk about this on YouTube. Hi. <laughs>